Felix here. Good evening, guys from Hong Kong. Great to have you on the call here. And as Andrew says, good morning, money makers, which is um, a very nice way to uh, tie us into what we're going to talk about today, because that's what it's all about, guys. It's all about making money. And money is good, actually. A lot of people think uh, have, have bad associations with money. We do not which is why we are a lovely community here and I truly appreciate you guys tuning in. Now, as always, guys, this is not financial advice. This is just for entertainment only. Always bear that in mind. Always do your own DD, do your own research, do your own discounted cash flow model, read the financial statements, uh, really dig into the stocks you're investing in. And if you don't know how to do that, as always, uh, the master stocks course down below will teach you all, of that, all about that. And if you want to earn passive income, the options trading course, that's that's the one, uh, will teach you that. And both have the money maker coupon 29% off as, as Andrew led us in very, very nicely. So uh, remember that, guys. And uh, Adam, uh, great to have you on the call here. Blake, lots of lovely familiar faces, guys. Uh, we need to pull open the economic numbers that have just come out. And I've literally just come back to my desk. So I haven't seen them yet. So here we go. What are they? Friday. Personal income month-on-month uh, -month, uh, spending. Um, personal spending month-on-month -month is, it's a little bit lower than expected. Okay, we were hoping for 0.4% and we got 0.0%. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you. So uh, that is, uh, is, is, well, it takes the pressure off the inflation fears, but it obviously isn't particularly great for the, for the real economy. Now, this price index here is an interesting one because the Fed really likes it. It's the Personal Consumption Expenditure Price Index. And I would look at the month-on-month -month one because that's really a lot more uh, reflective of what's happening here lately. And that was forecast to increase 0.8%. So this is an inflation measure. It's only gone up 0.4%. So that takes the wind out of the inflation fears uh, sales quite a bit. And it's an important number. So inflation fears today are dampened twice. That's the way I would look, look at this. We are getting some more numbers at 10 o'clock. So literally in uh, 58 minutes, uh, we're going to look at those. In fact, uh, what we can do is I'll set a little alert for that and then it'll pop up uh, in, uh, in, in a moment here. So... I'd say this is good news. Certainly for us as stock investors, it's good news. I mean, uh, the, the spending stuff could have been up a little bit better. Now, the personal income is actually has decreased a little bit less. So that is good for uh, Americans that your uh, incomes are not falling as much as forecast. So that's a little bit better. I mean, the month before was minus 13%. So that sort of drastic falling off the cliff stuff is, is now uh, kind of gone, which is, which is fantastic. Uh, guys, I truly appreciate it if you smash the like button, guys, get our live stream going, uh, get that algorithm a kick in the backside to show what we're doing uh, to more people. Now, what are we going to talk about? Well, uh, we have a NEO deal. Uh, NEO is going to Israel in the next few days. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we have, let me just open up here a few things. We have a Palantir deal with Data Robot, and we're going to look at that and why that's important. Because Data Robot, guys, is now a partner of Palantir. And Data Robot was funded by Snowflake. So it's kind of an interesting one that those two are working together. And um, yeah, I think they, there's in a sense the main stories we're going to look at. But of course, we will also look at just what's happening in the market here. So let's pull up. Uh, well, we've got... 26 minutes, but let's have a quick look at what's happening pre-market. Um, extended hours, uh, change. Uh, CCIV is up quite nicely, 2.8%. We'll have a look at that. Uh, Netflix up, Barbara is up, JD. Most of the market is looking pretty happy and green, uh, and that's because we've got those numbers out at just at 8.30, and they are looking pretty good. So, okay, Palantir down a, a, a fraction, but that doesn't really mean a lot at this point. And BlackBerry actually had some decent numbers out, I thought, but they're down 3%. Uh, so that's a little unusual. Banks should be doing quite well as well because we have the, the stress test is basically uh, excited. Uh, well, sorry, uh, the, the stress test has been been passed with flying colors. So therefore expect some dividend it's, uh, to be paid out, expect some share buybacks from, from that lot. 
Uh, Adam, one of our lovely members, great to have you on the chat here. Uh, Colin, uh, as well, a lot of um, a lot of our regulars. Uh, Andrew is saying, sorry, Philco. Yes, Philco is in our Discord channel and he runs the BlackBerry channel. So he is always rather keen on BlackBerry. But at the moment, um, I just think it's a difficult thing to turn around a business like that. It's much, much easier starting one afresh, I always think. The, the perception to change is, is, is pretty challenging. So therefore, uh, I always think, you know, startups sometimes are much easier than turning around those old ones. Uh, I posted earlier in our Discord channel, guys, I'll show you that as well, a little bit of the roundup of what's going on. Well, one thing is the DD IPO. And I did a video on that about two weeks ago. Did I do one or two videos? I can't remember. Uh, and I think from memory, I was saying, if this is priced substantially below 100 billion, this is actually quite interesting. And because we, we did a comparison in that video, check it out, just search like DD Felix or something and you'll find it. Uh, and we did a comparison with a valuation compared to Uber uh, and just looked at, obviously it's a very, very ch China focused play. They are the dominant player by far. Uh, and the only word of caution I would say there is that, okay, the valuation that they're going for 62 to 67, I think it's fair. I think that's pretty fair enough, those share prices they're going for. But they are in a dominant market position and the antitrust legislation will apply to them. And therefore, they are going to be dragged through something a little bit like most of the tech stocks at the moment, whether it's Alibaba or Meituan or JD or everybody, because uh, will they have abused their dominant market position? I mean, I don't want to speculate, but I think, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I think everybody was up to the same shenanigans over the last couple of years of basically trying to squeeze out smaller rivals. Um, I mean, they bought obviously Uber out in China and Uber is a major shareholder still in DD and they'll benefit from this IPO, IPO quite substantially. But so that's really the only concern there uh, as a sentiment. Underlying business I quite like, but uh, the uh, the sentiment is a bit of a challenge there the next couple of months. Uh, Stefan here, thank you for joining. You are sharing with us. Tesla tells Norwegian authorities it will open the supercharger networks to all automakers next year. Do you think NIO is going to use it? Yes, absolutely. In Europe, definitely all charging networks of all car companies will be open to everybody. I mean, Europe already has a standardized plug. So it's just a question of payment and app access to the payment system and the apps. And the German government is also negotiating with Tesla. And yeah, that's that's going to be, it's just sensible, right? Why build redundant infrastructure? You know, like I always say, it's like having a, a Ford and a General Motor petrol station right next to each other. It really doesn't make any sense. So yes, they will. And you know what? It'll provide them some revenue stream because they will be able to make a little bit of profit on on, on that. I don't know how much. It'll be interesting to see that maybe in the next uh, earnings call, we get a bit of insight on that. But yeah, I think that's totally happening. I think all of that. And I think it'll also happen in the US. It'll just take a little bit longer. But if we look at Biden's uh, spend, spending plan today, I had a breakdown here earlier as I was coming home. Let me just open that up for you guys uh, and run through it because they've agreed the, um, basically the sort of infrastructure structure package is, is, is agreed, right? So that's quite a big one. And it's, the agreement is 579 billion. Now that is sort of a bipartisan thing, but these are like the, the more moderate people who are agreeing to things. So this is still going to get, uh, adjusted quite severely by the less moderate lot. Uh, and what's the spending? Well, interestingly, EV infrastructure is getting seven and a half billion. Uh, the big one, though, is, is transportation. And I suspect that will include quite a lot of, and I'm speculating here, uh, sort of, uh, you know, cash for clunkers type subsidies, which are basically just a way of funneling money to American car companies. And then you have ro roads, uh, other infrastructure, 266 billion. So 312 billion for transportation. Roads and bridges are 109 billion. And power is 73 billion. And for the whole EV transformation, of course, you need a new power grid. You need a much, much bigger grid than the US currently has. Uh, and you need a lot of big batteries. So this is going to be good for the battery guys. Then we have passenger and freight rail, 66 billion, broadband and brand infrastructure, 65 billion, water infrastructure, 55 billion, public transit, 49 billion, resilience, whatever that means. I suppose that's sort of uh, 
to prevent the kind of stuff we've just had for the pipeline attacks and those kind of things. Um, there might be some money in there for Palantir. Airports, 25 billion. Environmental remediations, that sort of cleanup, 20 billion. Infrastructure, 20 billion. Ports and waterways, 16 billion. And electric buses in transit, 7.5 7 billion. Who's going to build those electric buses in the US? I mean, it's not going to be BYD, I suspect. Uh, so who's going to build that? That'd be an interesting one. I haven't really seen a, a American company building EV buses. Anybody know? Uh, please shout out. And then we got... Um, and, and how are they going to finance it? Apparently, they're not going to raise taxes. They're not going to reverse the business tax cuts of Trump. It's going to be public-private partnerships. Now, I used to be a, a lawyer in the UK for a little while and worked on those. And basically what they do, they take your expenditure off the books. So it's a it's what the uh, Tony Blair government did in the, in the, in the late 90s. You can literally get, uh, you know, 100 hospitals built, they don't show up on your balance sheet as the government, uh, the private sector pays for it, but they obviously get a hefty return for that. Uh, and they get all the management contracts and all that stuff. So it's a pretty expensive way actually of uh, creating infrastructure. I, I don't think it's a very good one uh, from, from my experience, but uh, there we are. It's tempting for governments because they can basically say, well, we can get an extra 500 billion and nobody will notice. It won't be on our balance sheet. So it's kind of cooking the books a little bit there. At least that's my, my view of it. But it's going to be good for cyclical stocks, for all the um, construction type stuff, all those kind of companies that I personally wouldn't touch with a barge pole because, again, I worked for a little while for a construction infrastructure firm and, God, their margins, I think, were like 3% or something. They employed 100,000 people. I think they've gone into bankruptcy twice since. So not really my, my favorite one. Uh, 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 Joaquim, great to have you on here. Kuhn as well. Um, Felix and Formula One at the same time, you make it hard to choose. Well, surely it's obvious, isn't it? You leave the Formula One on with the sound off and, and you listen to me. I mean, that's surely the smart thing to do. Um, uh, Steph, Stephen is asking about uh, LKCO. Okay, we can have a look at that in a moment. Wabi Sabi, hello to you too. Shock City Rocker, you think, you think Rivian's going to build those buses? Okay, we can have a look at that. Um is anyone else getting numb to these huge numbers? Uh, says Desmond there. Welcome, one of our lovely members. Uh, yeah, it, it is kind of baffling, isn't it? It's just sort of throwing money out and then throwing money out under the table as well. Uh, I, I don't mean under the table. I mean off the books. So, I mean, I think the US needs some serious infrastructure spending. And I think it's actually the smartest thing that they can spend money on is infrastructure. And especially things like broadband and stuff like that actually give you a return because if your whole country is running on you know fiber optic broadband lots of people can sit at home in you know in utah in a farm or something and they can make money selling things online and you know it generates revenue generates employment and jobs and things like that they can live stream like i am here right so you know i've got a fiber optic cable in in in, in, in the wall obviously uh, so those things are actually good expenditure i like the infrastructure stuff it's all the fluff that gets attached to it that balloons these builds that is the really bad stuff but uh here we go um, Bobby Sabi, I'm glad the sound is improving, guys. We're still working on it. It's going to get better over the next couple of days gradually. I spend about an hour a day with a lovely sound engineer who's the kindest man I've ever met. Uh, and he understands these things, which I do not. So we are going to do some sound paneling in this room and, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. So it is going to get better. Um, Celebrating Midsummer's Eve here in Sweden in the Felix community. Oh, that's fantastic, uh, Joachim. Uh, I am glad you have that little party there. England versus Germany, Euro 2020. Okay, we're going to talk football. Uh, and Desmond says the rural areas in the US can now have broadband band to trade orange juice futures. Yes, uh, that is, uh, is, a, is a good one, Desmond. And, and, and talking about that, let's have a quick look at the futures before the markets open. So everything in the green here, uh, Dow Jones is up half a percent. So that'll be a lot of the cyclicals. And then S&P is up 0.18. Nasdaq's up 0.16. The Russell 2000 that uh, Palantir is joining today, right, is up 0.25%. Uh, VIX is down. That's the third day running, fourth day running. So that's good. So the panic is coming out of the market. And can you see that? No, you can't see that, but I'll uh, I'll open it up for you. Can you see that little chart there? We make it bigger in a second as well, but you can see how that's sort of fizzling off. So VIX basically measures options contracts 
out of the next month or two and is a, is a, is a volatility measure. So the higher that is, the more our shares go up in the next 30 days. Uh, and, and Desmond Orange Juice is in fact up today, which is good. Uh, Andrew said, Felix's next product, painted sound deadening panels. You know, that's not a joke. I'm seriously going to do that. I'm taking uh, canvas pink pa paintings I've already painted and I'm filling the gap because there's a three inch gap back there and it's the perfect sound panel and it isn't hideous. So uh, that, that, that's, uh, that's actually the solution. You're, you're, you're reading my mind, Andrew. <laughs> uh, so let's look at a couple of stories here. So we've got a, a lovely Neo story which I posted earlier in the Discord, guys. And if you're not part of that yet, well, you are missing out because, uh, well, you know, you get it all earlier, but otherwise you just join me on the lives. But you can get there through the Patreon, guys. It's 50 cents a day. Uh, and why do I charge for it? Sometimes people ask, because I want to keep the community quite small. Because if we opened it up, we would get like hundreds of people joining, which would be lovely in a sense, but if you get like 20, 30, 40 people jumping in there every day, it becomes a Reddit group and then everyone's just sharing memes and, you know, that kind of thing, which is fine. It has its place. And I do I do like Reddit, but we are looking at more at a kind of research-based community guy here, guys. So if, you, if that feels good to you, check it out. As I say, 50 cents a day. If you prepay for the year, you get a month off as well. Neo cars are arriving in Israel in the next few days, which is quite a big one. And why? Well, for a robo-taxi trial. So you might have heard of Mobile Eye. Mobile Eye is a um, autonomous driving company that Intel acquired in 2016. It's Israeli, and they have been working with like most OEMs, like BMW and companies like that, for years. And they were actually going to do this with VW cars uh, uh, to run this fleet of robo taxis in Tel Aviv as a trial. But uh, Volkswagen can't produce, haven't got the chips or something, or I don't know, looking for batteries still somewhere in, in Scandinavia. And therefore, they are shipping a Neo ES8. And why the ES8? Because it just got European approval, right, to be sold. It, it's you basically. Um, you know, it's got all the licenses in place. And even though Israel obviously isn't part of the Euro European Union, uh, I think they follow similar legislation. And they are, after this trial, you know where they, these cars are going next? To Germany, to a trial too, because again, Mobile Eye is based in US, UK, France, Germany, Spain, and Israel. So that's quite exciting. And you know what? I actually think it's fantastic advertising because this is going to get a lot of media coverage. You're going to get a lot of local news um, channels covering this because you're going to have cars driving around without drivers. And I think that does attract attention. It's a little bit of an odd one for people. So this is quite a, a an interesting one. So they are basically putting their own sensors and things on top of it because obviously the ES8 doesn't have that yet. And then it is essentially running level four autonomous driving. So which means that the driver doesn't do anything at all. The driver literally just sits there and the driver gets prompted by the car if he needs to do something, but he doesn't really. And there is is a video on here on the uh, mobileeye.com website if you're interested in, in, in autonomous driving, which kind of, it's literally 25 minutes long. I watched about 10 minutes of it. It's quite, uh, it's like, I don't know, sort of car crash TV, you can't stop. Uh, but it's not, not in, a, in a good way. There are no car crashes. It's quite interesting, really, how it, it maneuvers and how it sees things. So that's really the future. And Neo is part of that. And I quite like that. Uh, I, I like the fact that they, they're choosing Neos. I think it's a it's a good thing for Neo, and and who knows they might be uh, and end up being partners with Mobile Eye as well. And then we have a few other stories out from Neo. Their venture capital arm, um, Neo Capital, has just invested in a second second hand used car trading platform. That's what they call it, not second hand. Uh, and it's kind of interesting because they are doing it together with uh, the son of the Geely Group founder, and the Geely Group owns. 10% of Mercedes, they own uh, Volvo and Lotus and the black cabs in London and, and, and lots of other things. So they, they, they know about something about cars. And of course, Williams Lees, the NEO uh, chairman's previous, um, previous business was a used car trading uh, platform, which used to be listed in, the, in New York, and then it was bought out by, by Tencent, and take, took, they took it private. So kind of interesting, they're doing a second one. So obviously, they really see a big market here in secondhand cars. And at the same time, NEO has launched the secondhand 
car or used car, I should say, a policy where they're basically going to guarantee that they'll buy back your old Neo at a fixed price. So they want to like, I think Tesla did this at the beginning as well. It basically makes takes away one of the concerns that people have when buying a car from a relatively new company because they think, well, you know, what's the value of this thing in five years' time? So Neo guarantees it. And by guaranteeing it and putting the funds up for it, I think they essentially don't have to buy any cars. So they might funnel it through these, these platforms that they're investing in. So that might be an interesting one to see how that basically fits into the, the wider Neo ecosystem as well. And then we got another little uh, award out. So the most promising new brand for growth in China is, wait for it, it's NIO. And it's conducted by uh, an institute of marketing in China. It's all over the state-owned media in, uh, in mainland China. So it's, it's obviously, uh, well, not obviously, but it's likely something related to some sort of state-owned media. And uh, NIO and Li Auto and Xpang all did rather well, but NIO sort of came out top. And they're basically saying, well, it's growing you know, fantastically well, uh, and uh, they are doing very, very well, and they're, they're, they're growing, and their revenue is great, and it's a fantastic brand, and all of that sort of thing. So I think it's a it's good to have these accolades. It just helps with building the brand and the image. You can point to something, and uh, so I think it's, it's it's a good thing. I think it's it's con very positive. They keep keep getting this kind of recognition in uh, in uh, in well all sorts of awards, right? That they're winning. Uh, okay, you guys are throwing out uh, Sophie uh, Stock 77. Uh, Sophie, I, I did a video, I did a two or three videos actually on SoFi. Is it SoFi or Sophie? I, I never really know. Um, I guess it's Fi, isn't it? SoFi. I did a video on it. I looked at it first. I looked at it sort of very quickly and I thought, ah, I don't really like this. And then I looked at it and a lot of you guys gave me pointers of why you love it and a lot of the users of the uh, the app told me why they love it. And I did another deep dive on it. I did a correction on that. So look for that. Look for that. I think it's so far a mistake or something. Uh, look on it. I've got a playlist on it and have a look at it. And I actually quite like it. Uh, why do I like it? Okay. I think a lot of banks will go out of business. Governments will drag that out for, for years and years and years, but a lot of these banks deserve to go out of business. They've got high fees, very poor service. So SoFi essentially is becoming a bank. Uh, they're acquiring a small community bank somewhere, uh, aiming to get a bank license, but that's a little bit speculation, that part. But really, they're offering a good service at good rates. Uh, they're cross-selling. Uh, they have these, you know, Henry's, uh, if, if, if you know what I mean. So, you know, um, not, not, not yet rich, a type, you know, young consumers who have a pretty good income. So higher earners, uh, not yet rich. Uh, that's the acronym. And they obviously have the, their college debt, but, you know, they're rolling out all the other financial services that a bank would have. And all, literally every single one who I've spoken to and who's been messaging me, they seem to absolutely love the app. And that's important. Uh, the valuation, again, doesn't seem crazy to me. Uh, we can pull it up here for a second. Let's have a look in terms of momentum, what's going on there. So, okay, at the moment, momentum is not particularly great. It's just coming down a bit. So you can see that here. It's, it's literally just above the 50-point line here. So it's just dipping into that a little bit dangerous territory. So uh, I, I, would, I would hold off a little bit if you were thinking about it. But uh, always, as I say, do your own research. And if you want to know how to do technical analysis and really do some research... Well, guys, check out the Master Stocks course down below because that's really where I teach you all about how to invest, how to pick stocks, how to analyze them, how to do discounted cash flow models, read financial statements, how to uh, do technical analysis and, and, and everything else that you kind of need to know when you're buying a stock. So check out that, make a note of that coupon, 29% off Moneymaker, and that expires at the end of Sunday. So not long left, guys. Uh, have a look at that. So... Uh, yeah, so in terms of momentum, not looking absolutely wonderful. And in pre-markets, down another 5%. Uh, is there something happening here? Uh, I can't see why, to be honest with you. Um, no, can't see why that is falling off at 5%. Uh, do you think it's got something to do with the, the banks now having more access to more capital? It might make it a little bit cheaper for them to operate. Uh, I, I, I'm really not sure, uh, but no, it doesn't really tell us here. Robinhood is uh, want investors who flip their shares could be restricted from participating. Okay, Robinhood is is kind of got a bit of a strange sort of policy going on, right? 
Uh, so fintech rival uh, SoFi also recently launched an IPO platform enforcing similar restrictions by collecting fines from flippers or customers who sell their shares to take advantage of the first day pops. Uh, okay, so maybe maybe that's got something to do with it. That came out on the 25th. Uh, no, that's today. So that no, that can't be it. So yeah, I, I, I'm not really quite sure what that's pulling down the sentiment here, but it's sort of being dragged down a little bit. So I'd be a little bit cautious there. Um, uh, Roti Boy, thank you. I sometimes don't show you the chat just to keep it interesting. No, seriously, I, I appreciate you, you shouting it out. Uh, do I have any cryptos right now? Yep, uh, I, I'm not particularly happy, obviously, about them <laughs> at present. Uh, for me, it's just one of those things. You, you, you make the gamble, uh, so you just I just have to sit it out because nothing has changed for me from a fundamental point of view, and that's always what I look at. The reason I bought it, has that changed? Uh, has the use, user model case for that changed? Uh, the ease of doing transactions, the inflation fears, the Fed's relentless money printing, uh, all, all that stuff. Has any of that changed? No. So therefore, it's just a sentiment thing. I, I really wish that people would stop listening to Elon Musk on this because the whole purpose of the cryptos is that it's decentralized. If we are letting Elon Musk uh, basically centralize it around his Twitter account, then we are not really gaining very much here. So I, 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 I kind of wish people would uh, jump off that bandwagon of, of listening to whatever Elon says, but uh, that might not happen. Uh, so far, it's shorted more than 25%, says Georgie. Okay, thank you very much. So, so people seem to be, I don't know, having a bit of a go at it or think, think that it's... it's um, it's over overvalued perhaps let's have a quick look at that uh what was it so far uh, i haven't got a short float number here okay interesting short ratio 6.33 that's not massive so that's basically uh, it takes six days to fill fill the shorts six days uh trading so mm, uh, let's have a look at um, fintel short ownership Funnily enough, I literally recorded a video to explain all these short terms today uh, for our um, course members. Actually, both courses have access to that. So if you are interested in that, check that out, guys. Uh, where are our short interests? There are no short shares available, like none at all. Okay, that's a little bit unusual. Uh, so that maybe implies something's going up there. And look at the short borrow fee. Crikey. Okay, you're totally on the money there, uh, uh, Georgie. You, you know your stuff. 222% uh, uh, short borrow fee. So this is being heavily shorted. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't get that. A normal rate is 0.3%. And these are, these are annual fees. And uh, short volume is 45. That's pretty high also. And... Okay, short interest. That's not very high. 2.8%. But there's obviously something going on there. Look at all these puts. Ah, that's what it is. Look at all these puts. So people are buying puts uh, like mad, betting for this to go down. Uh, and it's lovely competitors like Goldman Sachs, Bank of America. Uh, so it's Bank of Montreal, UBS Group. Everybody is in on it. Uh, so is this is this something to do with actually an issue in SoFi's underlying business model? Or is this just... Um, all the uh, main major banks like Nomura and Goldman's uh, uh, having a go at their competitor. Uh, because these are pretty sizable positions, right? Um, you know, $40 million for Siskahana uh, that they're betting against that. So that's putting the pressure on it, basically. It's it's options. It's not actual shorts. It's options. Uh, that's what, what that's about. So that's an interesting one. Um, Simon, okay, you've got some SoFi shares. I only have like 30 shares. Um, okay, I mean, I, I have not done a deep dive on this for probably about a month or so, so I don't know if anything's changed in their business. It looked pretty good to me. Uh, but so yeah, have a bit of a look at that, Simon. See if you find something that sort of jumps out at you or if this is literally a bit of a a bit of an attempt by the old banking world to squash somebody who's a real threat to them because I think SoFi really is. Andrew, any thoughts on crypto? Look, I don't think anything's really changed on crypto. I think it's a sentiment issue. I think if you look at a, um, you know, look at a, at a Bitcoin uh, chart and, and you just have to accept this massive volatility for extended periods of time, right? If we go back in time here a bit. Uh, whoops. You know, 
look at what we were doing in 2018. We were at 19,000. We went back down to 6,000. Then we went back down to 3,000. And it took till like, you know, two years later to go back up there. I'm not saying that's necessarily what's going to happen here. But if you do have to have a massive breakout, and we're still above 30. So 30 seems to be really the support uh, at the moment. I If it goes below that, I think we are in trouble. But um, I think you know, it is just what it is. It's, it's a highly speculative investment. So when we, when we make highly speculative investments, uh, we just have to accept massive volatility and uh, hopefully have the time span uh, to, to wait it out. And then hopefully it will. Obviously, there are no guarantees that it will. But just look at who's bought, uh, bought below, above 30,000. So most of the volume, and by volume, I mean here on this right side, can you see these blue bars? That's the buy-in volume. So most of that buy-in volume sits sort of between 32 and 36, 38. Now, there is a bit of buy-in, quite a bit actually, at the peak here, sort of 56 to 58. So that's obviously the painful part, 54 to 58. There's a little bump there. But most of the volume is down here in the sort of 30, around 36,000. So in, in a sense, that's a good thing. Uh, what it might mean though is that every time we go up a little bit into the 34 35 36 37 some of these guys jump out and they basically want to close their positions at zero so that's part of the strange human psychology that we really don't like closing positions selling positions at at, at zero and it makes no sense at a loss rather because say you bought bitcoin and you don't think anything has changed you don't think fundamentally the reason why you bought it has changed then just because it's gone down doesn't mean you'd sell it, right? Because that wouldn't make any sense. It's now cheaper to buy if you still like it, so you might buy more. If you thought it was a now a bad investment and that you'd made a mistake or something had fundamentally changed in, in the Bitcoin crypto sphere, then you'd sell it as soon as possible because if you thought it was something was bad, it would go down further, right? So to wait till the entry point and sell then makes no sense. But that's human psychology. And that's, again, that's one thing I teach you guys in the uh, the stocks course because super important to understand how the herd moves and, and how you can move against it and make some serious money with that. And that's in the master stocks course uh, down here. So make a note of that uh, money maker, 29% off coupon, guys. It expires on Sunday. And of course, with that comes also a private chat group with like-minded investors and myself. So you can ask me uh, that. Um, Andrew is asking, do I subscribe to the Hong Kong I-bond? No, no, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not buying bonds. I, I don't see the return, to be honest with you. Uh, I, I'd rather buy PayPal or something like that uh, or Facebook, because to me, that's a similar investment, but with a much, much higher return. Um, Mark says, um, uh, in November, NEO, th through its wholly owned subsidiary, completed the full redemption of equity interest in XPT, which is the company that makes its powertrains, its, its engines, essentially, and its batteries. Uh, and they now, uh, therefore, own uh, indirectly wholly owned XPT. Um, okay, interesting, Mark. I thought that since then we were told that they had let in some strategic investors. Uh, but uh, you might well be right on that. In the in the uh, filing chart uh, from the last annual return, it is shown as 100% subsidiary. So the end of last year it was. My thought is that since then, they have some minority shareholders on board. And that could be, I'm speculating here, that could be CATL or it could be uh, the local government or you know somebody who is providing them long-term support there. Um, uh, what do I think about Lee Auto, says Brian. I like Lee Auto. I think they make good cars. I think they are a very efficiently run company. I think they're going to make a profit pretty soon. But what I don't like about it is how much it's shorted. Uh, we seem to be talking about shorts quite a lot today. But if you look at... Um, actually, what we can look at very easily here is... No, that's not the one I wanted. I wanted the stock market map, which obviously is out of date. But Finvis has a little, uh, if you scroll down in Finvis here, there's a float short option. And in here, you can always find Lee. And Lee is 36% uh, of their float is shorted. And that's a number that puts me off. Um, that's more than Nikola. Uh, that's more than Ride. That's more than, uh, almost the same, a little bit more than Workhorse. Um, so 
that puts me off because obviously there are some people who take issue with Lee for whatever reason. I don't know what that reason is, but that alone does rather put me off, I must say. Uh, uh, Mark says, I'm going to look more about that at XPT. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, do. I... I've done some videos, actually quite a few on that. Uh, I don't know how easy you can find them because my Neo playlist is pretty enormous. Uh, but we've done, I think, 120 videos or so on Neo so far. So <laughs> there's quite a lot of information on there. You might be able to find it in that. Otherwise, if you do find it, Mark, it'd be lovely if you could share it with us or you you can't. Yeah, you can just let us know in, in the next live chat. Um, I am not I don't know if I'll do one tomorrow. It's my birthday, so I might not be back in time. But uh, otherwise, we can do it. Uh, we, you can you can share with us on Sunday if you find something. Uh, Luis, on inflation. Uh, yes, let's, let's go back to that, guys, because it is interesting. What happened to my inflation number? Okay. So this inflation number here is kind of what we want to look at, but we want to see it on a month-by-month -month basis. So we're going to open this up again here. Uh, the economic calendar. We are going to get some more numbers also in about 24 minutes, which be interesting. So the the main number in here is, uh, this is Thursday, uh, here is, it's Friday today, right? <laughs> here is Friday. So the PCE um, price index, uh, and that's why I had that open, because I wanted to show you what PCE stands for, Personal Consumption Expenditure Index. Uh, and that is the cost of services um, and goods, uh, it excludes food and energy, uh, I think. Uh, and basically, it went up 0.4%, but we were expecting a 0.8% increase. And it's always with all financial results, with all uh, economic data, it's always the real number versus the forecast. That's what matters. It's not really about the number itself. It's like, what was the prediction, right? So you need to know what the forecast was. Uh, and this website very, very uh, nicely shows us that. It's called tradingeconomics.com. It's a really good resource, I find. Uh, and it's half of what was forecast. So this really takes the pressure off the inflation numbers because half is, is a lot, right? Um, it says here, US stocks rose on Friday with the S&P 500 hitting fresh record high and heading for the best week since April. Supported by prospects of a strong economic recovery and reassuring remarks by the central bank's narrative about a temporary spike. Um, and we got strong earnings yet yeah, from, from Nike. Actually, we got really good earnings from Nike uh, and disappointing from FedEx. Okay, so that's a little update there from them. But let's go back to where is our number? <laughs> Okay, we lost it. We lost it. Why? Here we go. So that's a really good thing. Now, the other thing that's very positive for us growth stock investors is that the personal income month on month, so that's your, you and me income, uh, is was expected to be down 3% month on month. It's only down 2% month on month again. So therefore, it is 30% uh, less down than expected. So it's good news. It might not look like it. as You just look at the headline figure of minus two, but it's good news. And so again, what does that mean? It means, well, income is falling a little bit less. I mean, in a sense, you could say that puts a little bit more pressure on inflation, but not that much, really. Uh, uh, so really, I think the, the key number here people are looking at today is the PCE number. We are at 10 o'clock getting some um, Michigan consumer uh, inflation expectation numbers. So they will also be interesting to see. It was 4% forecast. Let's see if it's above uh, above that or, or, or not. So all of this stuff together, but the PCE is one of the Fed's favorite indicators because it's a little bit more uh, refined than the CPI. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for all the uh, uh, pre-happy uh, birthday wishes. Um, you're going to be 29 this year, Felix. Uh, you know, 16 uh, CH, absolutely. <laughs> Getting younger every year. Uh, that's the way we roll. Uh, getting younger and getting richer. That's really the plan, isn't it? And uh, now let's have a quick look at Palantir here because, again, I shared that story with our uh, Discord community earlier. So if you want to get on that, guys, you know how to get there through the Patreon. Uh, and Palantir has a new partner, and the partner is called Data Robot. And Data Robot, if you don't know, is a company that has some serious investment backers behind it. And Hewlett Packard, 
Snowflake. And I, I saw Snowflake and I'm like, um, what? Snowflake? I thought Snowflake is sort of meant to be a competitor uh, of, of Palantir with 110x uh, evaluation of sales, whereas uh, Palantir is, is at about 30. So that's always the one that uh, I hold up when people say Palantir is expensive. I say, well, that, Snowflake, what's that then? Uh, you know, gold plated or something. So pretty good black rocks in there. Um, Clearbridge, Glynn Capital, uh, lots of guys. So Snowflake is also a partner of theirs. But what do they do? Well, they basically do AI uh, and they work in this particular partnership. This is for retailers. They're saying retailers find demand forecasting ever more challenging. So this partnership of Data Robot and Palantir creates a unique real-time solution to help solve the most pressing demand forecasting problems. So what it seems to do to me is that it takes the data from Foundry, because Foundry is fantastic at, you know, getting lots of data together, right? So it gets that data from Foundry. Foundry sends the data into Data Robot. Data Robot does this, its AI thing and creates lots of models. It then sends the models back to Foundry so that layman can use those models in a visual way, in, in the way Foundry does it very well. So it's kind of like Data Robot is sort of a plugin into Foundry, and, and I really like that. And, and again, Data Robot runs also on AWS. Uh, they have quite a lot of big retail clients like um, Carrefour, for example, which is one of the biggest supermarkets in not just in Europe, but actually in the world. It's French. And it basically is, uh, the whole thing is about supporting retailers to manage this challenge, uh, manage their, their data, their demand forecasting, uh, their promotions and all this stuff. And you know what's funny? When we first started talking about Palantir, I was always sort of trying to explain it and say, well, when I go into a retailer and I buy a shirt, you know, I never get a decent promotion from them because they haven't got any system that knows actually what the inventory is, who I am. They, they have all the data, right? They know who I am. They know what I buy. They know my size. They know where I live. Uh, they should know what they've got in inventory. They know what new stuff they've got coming in. They know I like to buy blue shirts, but I never get a WhatsApp message for them saying, hey, we've got this blue shirt in your size. It's the same cut as the one you bought on the 13th of May. Do you want another one? Click yes. We've got your payment details. We send it to you within 12 hours. You know, if you've got that sort of thing, I buy things, right? So this is kind of actually retail adopting that sort of model um, of demand forecasting, uh, hooking in their inventory and their promotions. And this could be the end of your, uh, you know, end of end of season, everything's 50% off sale because that's massively wasteful, right? I mean, it's a total waste of time. Palantir is up here, by the way, 0.5%. Uh, Let's have a quick look over at the market as it's open. Uh, where did it go? Right, here we go. So this is pre-market. We want the real market. So this is live, guys. This is second, second by second NASDAQ. So what's up? Uh, by do JD, Barber, oh, quite significantly up, actually. Uh, the Chinese stocks are up quite a bit. Xpang up, Li up both 1%. Uh, we have Neo up 0.2%. Uh, Palantir up half a percent. And okay, VIX is going up a little bit, but not that much, just a little bit, 0.4%, a little bit of volatility in here. And who is down? Coinbase still. Okay, so that's that's always Bitcoin related. Um, and BlackBerry, sadly. Uh, Amazon down a touch, PayPal down a touch, but not very much. So uh, Klaus, great to have you on here. The Baba Dragon is waking up. Uh, yeah, I'm actually going to record a video also on Alibaba. I think there are the main thing really happening is that from the sort of rumor mill of the Chinese financial press, the rumor seems to be that the Ant IPO will actually happen now at the end of this year. Uh, that seems to be the consensus. And that's because they, they're they saying all the regulatory hurdles, the vast majority of them are now behind, behind Alibaba and behind Ant. And therefore, that's actually going to happen. And that'll be a good thing, I think. I think that'll be a bit of a shot in the arm. I don't think it'll be a, as big a shot on the arm as we were hoping for. I don't think it's going to take us to $300 in a flash. I think there's still too much negativity uh, around the sentiment for, for Alibaba, but it might just wake us up and get us back to sort of the 250s or 260 levels. So uh, we certainly hope that people are starting to re realize that. I mean, uh, ARK bought some two, three days ago, right? They added to their position, which is a 
little steps that build sentiment, right? We've had 10,000 negative articles, so we also need a couple of thousand positive little items of news to get us back to where we, we need to be. Um, the bank stress tests were conducted with balance sheets on 29th of October 2020. Filco is saying, is that a potential problem? Well, do you think they've worsened substantially since then? I, I don't think they necessarily... I mean, COVID really hit the US in March, right? So over the summer months, you would have thought the impact would have been felt. Uh, there were probably companies running into trouble later in the year. You, you, you are quite right. Uh, that's possible. But I think the numbers seem pretty solid. I think the fact that the Fed is saying to them, hey, you, 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 you know, you're going to we're going to release this money that we've got tied up. You'll be able to uh, pay dividends again. You'll be able to buy back shares. It seems to indicate that there isn't really much room for concern there. So I think they are pretty well capitalized. Uh, John, thank you very much for the uh, early happy birthday messages, guys. Uh, you are very, very kind. So it's looking like a very nice Green Friday. Um, I think the inflation numbers this morning were certainly uh, encouraging for us. And if you really want to understand inflation and what it does to in your investments, uh, guys, I recommend the Master Stocks course down below, 29% off. The coupon is Moneymaker that expires on Friday because it's important to understand what stocks go up, what stocks go down, why they go up and down, and by how much they go up and down uh, when you see these numbers, right? And if you understand that, then you kind of adjust accordingly. And if you've been watching me for a while, guys, I know some of you have, uh, I've been saying since the beginning of January, I, I, you know, I, I'm putting new money into value stocks. I'm not selling the growth stocks, but I was appreciating that they might go through a bit of a rough time. So I was putting new money into value stocks. We've done very well. And of course, the growth stocks have gotten hit, hit over the head in, in that particular time period. So uh, Jason, you're saying smash the like button. Uh, yes, please do, guys. I, I'm slowly and gradually sort of climbing out of the... Uh, the hole I made for myself within the YouTube algorithm, which is lovely because, I mean, it gets all of you here. I truly appreciate that. But when you put out content that YouTube doesn't like for whatever reason, then you do it twice in a row and then you really are uh, in, 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 uh, in, in algorithm jail. And that lasts somewhere between three to four weeks. So in that period, and I'm, I'm in that period, I particularly appreciate your likes, guys. It makes an enormous difference, your comments, uh, your shares, your subscriptions, turning the little alert bell on. All those things signal to YouTube, okay, I'm going to show those videos more because even if you're a subscriber, you will not get suggested all of my videos. And especially when I'm in the YouTube doghouse as I am at the moment, uh, you will get suggested very few of my, vi my videos. If you want to see them, turn that little alert bell, guys. Same applies to any YouTuber, of course, or any other uh, YouTuber you follow. The same thing uh, matters. You guys truly have power. Uh, does the master stocks course teach discount and cash flow models? Can you briefly explain what we learned, uh, Michael? Yeah, actually, if you want, I can, I can pull it up for you here and I can actually show you. So um, here's the master stocks course. Uh, you can actually, if you go on the page here, it shows you in quite a lot of detail uh, what we teach here, all the lessons and, and, and all that. And you can see the course curriculum. Now, you, of course, you can't click into it if you haven't bought it, uh, but you, um, there is a money back guarantee, so you can, could always do that. There is in advanced, hang on, advanced investing. So we have here a discounted cash flow model template, and then we have a, a, a lecture on that. And I'm just going to make sure the sound's off, otherwise you hear me twice. And what we go through here, of course, we explain the whole present value uh, story and how that works. Uh, and then basically, I on the right is the... Oh, you can't see anything. Sorry, guys. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, let me go back a touch. Uh, so if you go on the... Um, apologies, guys. I don't know why I keep doing that. So if you go on the Master Stocks link... You see all of this information that breaks down quite a lot of detail, what's going on there. And then down here, you see the curriculum, which is, is still growing, by the way. And you see the, the template. And then you see the discounted cash flow model class. And in here, I show you how you actually do this. So I show you literally how you find the information. Um, and it's, it's available for free on the internet. You just need to know where to look. And then... I tell you literally about 10 numbers, how to plug them in, where to plug them in, and the, it's color-coded, so you can really do it. And I really guide you through it. We do it for, on, on Tesla here as an example. And then you will be able to make your own discounted cash flow models. And it isn't difficult. I mean, I think having a template truly helps. And then it gives you also a visual 
in, in sense of intrinsic value and 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 you know what's the upside and that sort of thing. So you basically need to plug in a couple of numbers and then it does the rest for you. And then I explain to you what all of the other things mean, uh, where you get the multipliers from. Uh, you can compare it to other companies in that sector and so on. And if you understand that. Uh, then you also, it really guides you into the um, economic section, because I used to be an economist, uh, and, you know, how inflation affects growth stocks and why, and what to do for inflation investing, and also which of all these macro e economic indicators, because there are so many, right, which actually matter. And that's super important to understand, because if you look at, just look at the economic data this week, uh, that's basically out in the news, right? So, What's out in the news, it's basically all of this. So this is just this week, right? All of this data came out this week. Very, very little of it matters. So if you know which of it matters, you can watch it and then you understand how that impacts your actually share, the actual portfolio and your shares and your models. So I think buying a share without doing a discounted cash flow model is a little bit like running in the dark. Uh, I wouldn't really recommend it. If you don't want to do it, and I appreciate some people just say, I haven't got the time, I haven't got the interest, then just buy an ETF, buy QQQ. You'll still make a lot of money. Buy SPY, you make a lot of money over time if you do it in a regular stru stru structure. And that's, of course, also something I, I teach you guys is, uh, is, is how to actually have that strategy and how that compounds and how you really build long-lasting wealth. So thanks for that question there, Michael. Uh, I hope that appreciates it. Um, and I appreciate you recommending uh, the, the, the channel. It truly helps. Uh, it's really you guys who, who make the community. So um, if you ever want me to cover something, let me know. I, I listen to you guys uh, and, and I follow that. So uh, just to go back to Data Robot here, you can see a little bit who they work with, uh, uh, Palantir's new partner. So Snowflake <laughs> is, a, is a partner, which is quite amusing, really. Uh, Harris Farm, we've got TC Capital, we've got Kroger, we've got um, American Fidelity, the National Association of Realtors. They've got quite a varied, Carrefour, for example, they've got quite a varied client list uh, across all sorts of sectors. So I think it's good. I think Palantir doing these partnerships is fantastic. One of the main things I always look for when I buy software is its ability to work with other pieces of software that I might be using, right? And there's nothing more frustrating than having something that doesn't work with something else. So literally, the bigger this partnership program gets of theirs, I think the more attractive the, the software inevitably becomes for for company so it just becomes more accessible. Uh, let's have a quick look in that as we are talking about Palantir here on the Palantir stock, which is down, it's just down a, down a fraction, not really very much. Uh, and what's going on here? Let's have a quick look. So let's have a look at a fast indicator. So for growth stocks, Williams R is quite a good one. It gives you very rapid momentum. Uh, and still momentum is looking very good. And why do I say that? Because the sell point or buy indicator point comes for this red line here. So where, where we crossed... Over here, that was the buy signal. So that over here was the buy signal, and that was around what, 17th May or so. So if I put that in up here, okay, I didn't mean to draw that line. And I move this up a little bit. You can see that was up here on the 17th of May. And now, the can you see the blue bars here on the right? That is the buy-in volume at that particular price point. So if you go over here, that's exactly the price point where... Uh, the uh, indicator told you to buy. Uh, and you shouldn't do it blindly. You should look at a little bit of what the company is about. Uh, but a lot of people do, and you can see it. You can literally visually see it here. A lot of people do. And then where does the retail investor buy? The retail investor buys at $24.56, whereas the institutional investor buys at $20. So that's a big difference, right? That's 20% difference. Uh, just from understanding these kind of uh, indicators, so again, I recommend understanding technical analysis, guys, and I, I teach you that in the Master Stocks course. So check out that link below. Uh, and and um, as I said, you also get to join our lovely uh, private chat community for that, for all the course members. So you can talk to me and some uh, like-minded investors. If you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, any strategies, you can share screenshots and you know we can discuss these things. Um, Glenn is saying, why have you never covered Momo? Okay, let's have a look. Ooh, what am I doing? What am I doing? Momo. Is it very cheap? But well, I can't tell from the chart here alone if it's very cheap. 
a quick look is what, what the news is on here. Adjusting earnings per share are out. We got tech stocks get late push into the green. Um, yeah, to be honest, with you, why do I not cover it? But it's not terribly popular. I think that's really probably the the the, the short answer about it. I think some of you guys might have discussed it on the Discord, but it's not a particular popular uh, one. I can't really tell you very much. I mean, we got a buy signal here. That's that much is true. So the momentum is ch is shifting. Uh, so that was a buy signal here on the 22nd, and we seem to be having a a nice rally up. We've crossed through the 100-day moving average line, which is imp an important support, and it certainly has been the support today. So can you see that little faint green line, the tail at the bottom of that uh, bar chart there? That basically stopped just above the 100-day moving average line. So yeah, momentum is looking very good, but I can't tell you whether fundamentally this business is fantastic. The chart looks pretty much like most tech stocks do. So, um, but yeah, thanks for throwing that out. Okay, Glenn, you're basically saying they have as much cash at hand as their market cap. All right, let's have a quick look at that then. Binbox, let's have a quick look at their numbers. Uh, Momo. So we don't want the, okay, let's have a look at income statement. Uh, are they making a profit? The gross profit margin is 50%, although it's been declining. And net income is 300 million out of, that's not too bad. EBIT is 387. Okay, and let's have a look at their balance sheet. You say they have got tons of cash. They've got $515 million in cash. And what's the market cap? The market cap is $3 billion. So not quite, right? I mean, what's 550 out of 515 over $3 billion is 17% uh, cash or thereabouts. Yeah, about that. They have uh, some short-term investments. That, that would take the number up. So if you're talking about current assets, then, yeah, that is, is more than 50% of, um, of that. And if you, if you count the long-term investments, that's another billion. So the asset column is looking very healthy. The assets, assets are bigger than the market cap. So what's the snag? What's with the asset valuation? I suppose that's really the question. Is it really worth what they say it's worth? I mean, Goodwill is 600 million. I would maybe exclude that because that's Goodwill is one of those things that's kind of hard to measure, I always say. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're, you're totally right. I mean, their assets are basically the same as their as their share price, which is is, is a weird situation to be in. Uh, what's the what's the debt level here? I can't see it. Seven hundred fifty-five million. Okay, not not too much. Uh, so yeah, unusual. But what's the story there? There's got to be a story there too. That somewhere I would really do some deep digging and find out what do they own, what are those assets. Look at their quarterly report. Look at their annual report. Look at everything they own. What it is. How good is it? How, what's the quality of those assets? Uh, and and how are they valued? That's really what I would look about. Um, no, no, Glenn, you are you are quite you are quite right. Uh, actually, you were you were you were quite on the money. It wasn't just, but it's not cash; it's assets. So, with cash, you can't um, you know do anything with the valuation. Cash is just cash. But as they are as they are assets, it's always you know what are these long term investments that have gone up from a hundred million to nine hundred million in one year? I, I I just don't know what they are. But it's a pretty dramatic spike, right? You can see the chart here. So. Um, that's why it's important, I think, to un understand and, and not be scared of balance sheets and income statements because uh, you need to look at stuff like that. I mean, you see this on the balance sheet where, you know, you've gone from 100 million in long-term assets to suddenly nine times that figure. Me as an investor, if I'm going to buy this share, I want to know what that is. What do they buy? What do they acquire? What is it worth? Uh, it could be the greatest thing in the world uh, or not. So I, I'd want to know. Otherwise, uh, I, I don't really know what I'm buying because that's, you know, that's like... 30% of, their, of their, 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 their market cap, right? So where do they get that money from? So um, thanks for showing that out. That's, uh, that's a, a, an interesting one. Uh, Tesla, let's have a quick look at Tesla. Tesla is going up 0.5%. Uh, let's look at Williams R is pretty erratic for this in the, lately. So we've been kind of bouncing up and down and up and down. Uh, and you can see that here, right? The every time we cross 
this red line, we get a buy, buy signal or sell signal. So it said to sell here, it said to buy two days later, so it said to sell and then buy again and then sell again and then buy again. It's kind of like, uh, kind of slightly schizophrenic, a little bit like Elon Musk's tweets. Uh, so we're not really getting a clear kind of momentum signal there. Let's have a look at momentum. So let's change the colors here so you can see them. Um, and, and as I say, guys, you can do technical analysis yourself. It really isn't tricky. I've probably got about, I don't know, 10, 10 lectures or something like that in the uh, Master Stocks course. Uh, and if you, if you follow that and you play around with it and you do the homework, uh, you will be able to do that. So momentum has turned really nicely green. Uh, and that was on the 16th of June. So let's just put that in here. And let's have a look at, say, a Williams. Okay, we've got too many things open. Let's close our nine-day moving average line. And let's, okay, inflation expectations were coming, popped up here in the bottom. 4.2%, um, previously 46 Okay, let's jump to that in just a second. Let's just complete our Tesla here. So te this also gave us a buy signal here on the 17th of June, just the day after. And let me just paint that in. Okay, Michigan inflation expectations are lower than ex uh, falling, which is, Good. We're going to have a look at those numbers in just a second. So basically, Momentum gave you a positive signal here. Uh, one day later, we got a same positive signal from Williams R. So you get kind of that double confirmation. That's the sort of thing you look for uh, when you are entering into stock. So uh, ideally, therefore, that would have been the point to jump in and look at what the volume did here. Can you see all these blue bars uh, where those lines are? So the buy-ins during that day is exactly that period, precisely. So this here is, uh, these are people who understand technical analysis and who followed indicators and they bought it and they bought it at a, at a, at a decent price, uh, basically around $600. $600, of course, is also a big psychological mark. So um, should you now buy it at, you know, 12, 13% higher? Look, I, I never tell you what you should, should and shouldn't buy. Uh, I think it depends very much on your long-term horizon or are you simply... I, I always think there are two valid strategies for buying stocks. One is to follow technical analysis and, and time your entries and therefore be a little bit smart about it. Or you buy blindly, regularly, ideally every month. Similar amount every single month, come what may. The stock goes up 2,000%, it goes down to 90%. You are still buying, provided nothing's changed in the underlying business, of course. Uh, I think those are the two models. So one is averaging into it over time, and that way it doesn't really matter. Uh, but if you're doing that one-time big purchase only, I, I would recommend, first of all, I wouldn't recommend to do a one-time purchase on anything. Uh, but if you are that sort of investor, then I would certainly look at, at the uh, these indicators because why not, right? Why not buy something 15% cheaper? I mean, isn't it better? So uh, Neo's getting crushed, says Stefan. Okay, let's have a quick look at that. And then we'll look at the, uh, then we look at the economic news that's just out. So stock screener. Okay, Neo's down 0.9%. I mean, I, I, I appreciate the, the, the drama you bring in. Uh, and, you know, that, um, you know, I might put that sort of headline out. <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think, you know, movements within a percent or so uh, are, are neither here, here nor there, I, I would say. But you are right. There's a little bit of a shift at the moment out of the tech stuff. So let's have a quick look. What was that economic number we just got? We got... Um, Five-year inflation expectation is this, the same as forecast. So that's that number right here, this one. So that's okay. That's the same as we were expecting. The final inflation expectation for June is, however, slightly above 4%, 4.2%. So it's a little bit higher than we were expecting. So uh, that's the 10 a.m. news. Uh, the, this, the, the market turned at exactly 10 a.m. It might have done four minutes ago. So, I mean... In, 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 you know, let's put this into perspective. 0.2% uh, of an inflation expectation, does it really matter? No, not really. Uh, but it is just something, particularly given that we looked at the month-on-month um, -month, uh, price, in, you know, PCE price index just above, and those numbers are below expectation, below forecast. So I think it's a, it's a fairly neutral day on, on in front of the, in terms of the news. Um 
Mitra is asking which investors are supposed to get the dividends announced. Okay, bank stocks. Basically, all the bank stocks have had their cash tied up by order of the Fed uh, in, in return for support. Basically told them, don't pay dividends, don't buy back shares. We want you to be well capitalized during this COVID crisis. Uh, and they are likely to be told now that uh, as of Monday, they can, they can start uh, paying. Again, uh, Stefan, I like your smiley. Yes, uh, I, I might put you in charge, Stefan, of my my uh, my headlines. Um, you, you seem to be rather good at this. You want me to have a quick look at Baba? Okay, we can also do that. Let's have a look at Baba, uh, and Baba is picking up. It did have a good day in Hong Kong as well today. Uh, we are actually getting a buy signal here from RSI down here. Uh, let me just put that horizontal line as well. And momentum is also turning green. Uh, so, yeah, you know, the question is, is this one of these mini rallies or is this is this something a little bit more um, more substantial? We have gotten a lot of money pouring in at 210, uh, although also a lot of money pouring out at 210. Some people just giving up. Uh, is it finally going to go to 300, says FR8? Look, I very much hope so. I think we are still a long, long, long way away from that. I think uh, 300 is, you know, we need to get above that 100-day moving average line to start with. We need to get back into the 230s. I think that's where we need, where we need to, to get to at the moment. Um, seem to have missed it twice. Not your fault. <laughs> uh, Rick said, but SoFi has dipped. Yeah, so SoFi seems to be, uh, has massive, massive amount of put options on it. We just looked at that. Uh, I mean, really tremendous amounts. And it's all the banks. It's it's the Goldman's, it's the Nomura's, it's the Bank of America. They all bought tons and tons of put options on, um, on, uh, on SoFi. So uh, I don't know if there is an issue with the underlying business or they're not getting the banking license. Is there something that those guys know that we don't know uh, that might be, be worth uh, diving into? I... All I can show you here is, look, these are the short positions disclosed. This is These are May numbers, right? So we don't know what's happening at the moment because the way that that gets disclosed isn't very useful. But what we can see, which is a little bit more up to date, every 30 minutes, the short borrow fee rate uh, gets updated. And funnily enough, I literally recorded a lecture on this today for our course members. Both courses actually uh, get access to it, the short borrow fee rate, uh, to explain all of these terms around short interest, short ratio, short of float and all this stuff because it's massively confusing. And I've done a, a cheat sheet as well because so it comes with a PDF document so you guys can, you can look it up, you can refer to it. Uh, and that literally gets updated every 30 minutes. So the last update we had was 18 minutes ago but actually, it wasn't available, which is also unusual. But as of yesterday, the short borrow fee rate is 222%. So to borrow, so when you short a, sh a stock, you kind of should borrow. You need to borrow. You need to be able to borrow a, a, a share, right? To, otherwise, it's a naked short, uh, and that can get you into deep trouble. So normally, the interest rate you pay for that is 0.3% per year. So it's very little, right? Per annum. Now it's here, it's 200 something percent per annum, which implies that basically everyone's shorting this thing like mad. And look at the short availability. You can't borrow a share at all. I mean, you can't, there is nothing available to short, which is why they're probably all uh, doing puts. So there's something funny going on with SoFi. Um, I, I, I don't know why. I, I, we looked at the news, there was nothing in it, but uh, there is something there, yeah. It could be a nice buy. It could be, uh, or it could be. Uh, is it is it becoming a meme stock? I mean, who knows at this point? Microsoft hits two trillion in market cap. Seriously, that's fantastic. I love Microsoft. I've got tons of it, and I keep buying it. And I think I probably will never stop because it's just one of those businesses that just generates money, and it's becoming more and more of a subscription business, which is fantastic. So yeah, absolutely fantastic. What's the market cap here? A two trillion. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Look at that here. Market capitalization. Can you see that? Two trillion. 2.001 trillion. I mean, that's 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 uh, some achievement. Uh, and Facebook also, yes, a, another one of my absolute favorites. Um, are you big bullish on lithium stocks, footy tube? Yes, but you really have to know which ones. If you want to save yourself about three years of your life in research, join our Discord. We have a channel called EV Raw Materials channel. 
And we have a gentleman called Robert, who's not on the call here, uh, who uh, basically works in a related industry, I, I should say. Uh, he knows a lot about the stuff and he literally researches relentlessly. Uh, so if you want to get a starter to this, there is lots to avoid. That's the problem with mining. For example, clay mining, not proven. You don't know if it'll ever work. Uh, so to know which ones, don't just buy anything with lithium in it in, in, the, in the title. You could make a serious uh, serious error there so um he says here my picks for europe are erp and f uh, sav nf uh, and, and tlg rf uh, for america is litoff nmg mp and a few others so if you really want to understand that for mining stocks you have to do your research if you don't you're in trouble it's even much more required because you need to understand the geology and the chemistry uh, as well as the financial so uh, Join the master stocks course, guys. Uh, otherwise, you don't know how to do due diligence properly. Well, some of you do, but you know, if you really want to run through those discounted cash models, you want to understand the financials, all those things, uh, take advantage of that 29% off coupon. It's Moneymaker, and it's expiring on Sunday. And Desmond, I agree with you. Microsoft is a fantastic value stock. Um, Neo Israel, absolutely. Uh, Vio Kazna, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, recap that very quickly for you. Uh, and that is basically Neo is cars are just landing pretty much as we speak in Israel for a robo-taxi fleet and it's Mobile Eye, which you might know is an Israeli company that is owned by Intel and they are replacing VW cars which were meant to be used on that trial but they're not and after this trial or in parallel they're also going to ship these ES8s to Germany uh, also for a robo-taxi trial there so that doesn't mean that NEO is available for sale there yet although apparently lots of Israeli companies have asked for dealership um, licenses, but NEO isn't giving it. They want to do it themselves. And it's going to be, I think it's a great marketing thing because people are going to literally see NEOs driving around without drivers, uh, both in Israel and then later in, in, in Germany as well, and then a couple of months. So uh, I watch that space. I think uh, that might well lead to an Israel, Israel expansion because, I mean, a lot of these tech companies that are in that autonomous driving space are in israel so i imagine there might be some quite some appetite for this there too so uh, that's the quick recap there on uh, on on israel thanks very much for that question guys i'm going to wrap it up here uh, check out the courses below the coupons expire on sunday it's a lovely community you also get to join our private chat groups there uh, and if you want to join the discord uh, you can do that through the patreon link all the links are in the description below uh, truly appreciate you guys hitting the like button it makes such a difference to me uh, so thank you for that guys thank you for your comments or your subscriptions thank you for recommending the channel i uh, truly appreciate you as a community guys uh, i've got at least two more videos coming out today so make sure you're subscribed i think tomorrow i'll probably skip the live because it's my birthday i might not make it but i'll, I'll definitely see you on sunday so uh, watch out for those lives and i look forward to seeing you on the next one